B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, November 27th, 2019. Want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have family, friends, and people to share the day with. And I open my podcast today with stories of men who are going to be grateful, very grateful, this particular Thanksgiving. And some of them originate in Baltimore, where Alfred Chestnut, Ransom Watkins, and Andrew Stewart will have their first Thanksgiving in freedom in 36 years. They were wrongfully convicted of a murder that long ago. And we have to commend the local prosecutor, state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, because she set up a conviction integrity unit to examine prior convictions won by the office that she now runs. This is a very important trend, and I fully support it, because we have seen a wave of exoneration since the late 1980s. Thousands of people have been released from prison in this country who were wrongfully convicted, and many of them spent years on death row. And the part of the equation that has not yet been addressed is the responsibility of prosecutors who use underhanded tactics and illegal methods to win these convictions. And that's what we need to focus on next. So I am very pleased that these three men from Baltimore, who've been through a nightmare of 36 years behind bars for a crime they did not commit, I'm happy to see that that's been overturned. And just last week, in a retrial in Baltimore, a 29-year-old man, Devon Little, was acquitted of a 2016 murder that he did not commit. Now, the case is a little complicated. There was a string of nine shootings in Baltimore between June 2015 and February 2017. And Little was a victim in two of the shootings, then was arrested in connection with a third. And so, in the retrial, Little was uh, successful in overturning that murder conviction. And the victim there was the father of two kids, 26-year-old Levon Stokes. And to win the conviction, the state's prosecution relied solely on testimony from three witnesses, Stokes' mom, his sister, and a friend. There was no physical evidence presented at trial that linked Little to the shooting. And there was ballistics evidence that was suppressed by the prosecutors. And Sarah Gottlieb, the public defender, found that uh, the mother of Stokes, his name is Tanya Cox, initially told the police that four men were involved in the shooting and then testified at trial that it was only Little who came out of an alleyway to shoot her son. Then the defense got a hold of video that had not been available to them at trial, and it showed that Stokes' friend was not standing on that corner where she claimed to have witnessed the murder. Now, Sarah Gottlieb, the public defender, says it is our position still that the person who killed Levon Stokes is still out in Baltimore right now. And this is one of the real critical issues. There are people who simply don't want to open their minds that wrongful convictions occur. And they support a faulty verdict without recognizing that the actual criminal is still at large and could be committing more crimes up to and including murder. So at BuzzFeed today, there's a powerful commentary by Jamal Trulove, a man whose case I followed here in San Francisco. He was falsely accused, spent seven years in state prison, and he writes with compassion for Chestnut, Watkins, and Stewart, 
winning their release. He says, I recognize my own story in theirs. In 2015, I left prison following seven years behind bars after being framed by the police for a crime I didn't commit. More than 2,515 men and women have been exonerated after proving their innocence. He writes, it's crucial to uncover wrongful convictions, and state's attorney Mosby should get credit for restarting and expanding her office's conviction integrative unit, the only one in the state of Maryland. And True Love says, it's why I campaigned for Chesa Boudin, the recently elected San Francisco district attorney, who promised to strengthen the wrongful conviction unit here. And then he writes, these three men will leave prison after 36 years with a paper bag of possessions from when they were 16. The headlines and attention from well-wishers will quickly fade, and then they will be alone. They might not know where they're going to sleep. Their closest family members may have died or faded out of their lives. They will be broke without any job prospects, technical skills, credit, education, or even job history to rely on. Many people like me came out of prison not knowing how to use a cell phone and with no credit history. All of this makes reentry much harder. After I left prison, True Love writes, the only place I felt comfortable in the two houses I owned was in the attic. I was so accustomed to being in small places. And the assistance they may receive early on will fail to materialize or will not last. For these three men, there will be no help from the state the day they leave prison. In Maryland, when a wrongfully convicted person is released, they can't access any of the services available to a convict being released. The person is simply turned out with no bus pass, no money, no ID, no social security card, no meds, nothing. We need more district attorneys to follow Mosby's lead in providing support following exonerations. And next week, Mosby is launching the Resurrection After Exoneration program in Baltimore. I also note that a federal judge has put a block in front of Bill Barr and Donald Trump's plan to resume the federal death penalty with executions scheduled for December and January. U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin in the District of Columbia Columbia, said that the inmates were likely to succeed in their argument that Barr's proposal to execute all four men using one type of lethal injection contradicts the Federal Death Penalty Act. And now on a personal note, I want to bookend this segment about wrongful convictions with an apology. For many years now, I have been advocating for a man who's on death row just a mile from me or so at San Quentin State Prison here in California. His name is James Anderson. And I've known him for eight or nine years. And he has always maintained his innocence. And over the years, I studied his case. I read his trial transcript. I listened to his narrative of the events. And first and foremost, I have observed that James Anderson did not get a fair trial. And that led me to believe his claims of pure innocence. And I am retracting my support for those claims, and I have ended my communication with James Anderson. When I first met him years ago, I told him that if I ever found he had withheld information or lied to me, that I would end our contact. And recently, a son of James Anderson, Anthony Bailey, contacted me, and he filled me in on things that James had never told me, such as his real name is Robert Lauderdale. And at one point, a long time ago, 1973, Anthony Bailey's mother was married to a man named Robert Lauderdale. And she died in New York City under very suspicious circumstances. James had never told me about that. And Anthony sent me a message saying, Look, I want the deceit and the lies to stop. It's not fair to the victims and the ones that put their heart and faith in a person that's being deceitful. I guess that's me. I just hope that Lauderdale spends the rest of his time making peace with God and himself and have closure within himself. 
He's still my dad, so he's forgiven. That's my closure. Anthony also put me in touch with James Anderson's co-defendant. Her name is Sheila Anders. She did 36 years because of the crime that James Anderson was convicted for. And she gave me enough information to find falsehoods in the James Anderson narrative of the double murder that occurred in uh, Coachella, California in uh, around 1972. And so, to my listeners, I apologize. I believed a man who was scheming and who was deceiving me. And this is the first time I have advocated for many people who claim to be innocent. And I have never been lied to before. But it happened here, and uh, I regret that I advanced and uh, supported his claims of innocence because they were not true. There is other news. Last night, Donald J. Trump held another one of those mob rallies in South Florida, on his way to Mar-a-Lago for the long holiday weekend. And he was in rare form. These, These mob rallies really get him going. First, he said it was the Russia hoax. Now the same Democrats are pushing the derangement impeachment. Ridiculous. They're pushing this witch hunt. Everything, everyone's saying that's really bullshit, he said. All right. If you want to put that term in play, Don, I call bullshit on the way you are pretending that you or your attorneys may participate in the next phase of impeachment by appearing before the House Judiciary Committee. Trump has been invited by Chair Jerry Nadler to appear on December 4th. That's next week. And Trump has acted like he's interested in testifying or sending his lawyers. Now, it's probably safer to send the lawyers because Trump, <laughs> he, he should never expose himself to an open forum where he will lie compulsively. And so I call bullshit on this. I, I do not think that he will do it. I think it's just one of those dangles. He loves to keep people guessing, keep people off base. And he has till 6 o'clock Sunday to notify Nadler if he is actually going to appear. At the New York Times today, Charlie Savage, a decent reporter, notes that while a federal judge has said that Don McGahn, the former White House counsel, must appear before the committees, that Trump is actually winning, even though he keeps losing some of these lower court rulings, you know, like on releasing his tax returns. Supreme Court came in and saved his ass on that one. And so what Savage offers is that the overriding goal of the Trump strategy is to keep information from coming out while his term and potential re-election hang in the balance. And he says the Trump legal strategy is succeeding despite all of the adverse rulings. Their real goal is to gum it to death and run out the clock. And it's interesting, speaking of the clock, uh, I heard a bit of Rush Limbaugh's radio show this morning, and he was speculating about how the impeachment hearings in the Senate, uh, the trial in the Senate, will probably extend and uh, overlap with the Iowa caucuses, perhaps some of the early primaries. And then without any real uh, stimulation, he just said, now uh, the turtle, Mitch McConnell, will drag it out as long as possible. And then he noted that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was back in the hospital. There could be a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And would Mitch McConnell honor the precedent that he set in 2016 of saying, you can't confirm a nominee during an election year? And Rush just laughed that off. He said he knows (laughs) that uh, Mitch McConnell would rush to confirm anybody with a pulse nominated by Trump. We're learning that uh, two officials in the White House Budget Office resigned after expressing their concerns about the hold that Donald Trump put on the military aid to Ukraine. 
And this comes from Mark Sandy, an official who is still at the White House Office of Management and Budget, the OMB. And he didn't name the people, but he said one of them resigned in September, and the second、uh, also resigned after offering a dissenting opinion about whether it was legal to hold up the aid that Congress had approved for Ukraine. Meanwhile, there's more dirt coming out of Ukraine, and it's, from, it's about the dirt digger himself, Rudy Giuliani. New reports show that he waged a public campaign to unearth that information on Trump's rivals while privately pursuing hundreds of thousands of dollars in business from Ukrainian government officials, the same people that he was squeezing, squeezing to give him dirt on the Bidens. Now, as you know, I don't think the Bidens are totally clean. I think there is some dirt there. <laughs> At any rate, this guy is such a sleazebag. And he's repeatedly said he doesn't have any business in Ukraine, the way Trump said he's never had any business in Russia. And so,、uh, in some cases, his discussions with Ukrainian officials proceeded to the point where he prepared a legal retainer. And his cronies at the Giuliani law firm, and that would be、uh, Tonsing and、uh, what's her husband's name? Victoria Tonsing and、uh, Joseph de Geneva. Well, they were pursuing business with some of the same people who Giuliani was working to shake down. So, this is a sordid case. It's a racketeering matter that involves so many people in the Trump inner circle. And as you can tell, as the Democrats have provided more evidence, I've found it more compelling. I still believe that the obstruction of justice has to be added in and the Michael Cohen crime for the payoffs, the hush money to Stormy Daniels and the Playboy Playmate. But I remain、uh, very skeptical of this. CIA whistleblower. And there's a powerful, lengthy read for you. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast to Consortium News, where Scott Ritter, who last time I appeared on CN Live, was there with me, and he revealed himself to be a pretty strong Trump supporter. But I don't think it clouds his judgment in this lengthy article without exposing the name of the CIA whistleblower. He profiles his experience in recent years, shows him to have been appointed to the National Security Council during the Obama years, and then、uh, actually hung on for the first year of the Trump administration.、Uh, Scott Ritter speculates that the whistleblower may have been responsible for the leak of the Mike Flynn phone call. And so I have always been skeptical that a whistleblower is inside the CIA and keeps his or her position after blowing that damn whistle. And so Ritter writes Did the whistleblower maintain his friendship with a, a guy named Misko from the NSC after leaving in July of 2017? Did the whistleblower collaborate with Misko to get the House Intelligence Committee? Misko now works there. To investigate the issues of concern to the whistleblower? Who did the whistleblower meet on the House Intelligence staff? What did they discuss? Who was the lawyer? And Alexander Vindman, Lieutenant Colonel, don't call him Mr.,、uh, he flatly testified that he does not know today who the whistleblower is.、And、that appears to be、uh, in dispute, I'll put it that way. Quoting more from Ritter, answers to these questions and more would, have been use, more would have been useful in understanding not only the motives of the whistleblower in filing his complaint. There is no doubt that Congress has a constitutional right and obligation to conduct proper, proper oversight of the operations of the executive branch and to hold the President of the United States accountable if his conduct and actions are deemed unworthy of his office. But the major issue looming in the background of this impeachment is the intervention by elements of the intelligence community in the domestic political affairs of the United States. There is no question that the whistleblower's complaint served as the genesis of these impeachment proceedings. The legitimacy of the underlying issues being investigated are not at issue here. The legitimacy of the process by which these proceedings were initiated is. So I encourage you to read it. 
I think he raises a lot of vital questions. He acknowledges that he's not trying to uh, shift the outcome of this, but that he's very concerned. And this politicization of the intelligence uh, community doesn't begin or end with the Ukraine saga. Also at Consor- Consortium News today, I want to recommend a great piece by my buddy Pepe Escobar. And he went to a conference in Kazakhstan where the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Sarif, just went off. And he went off in a way that I find highly credible. He talks about the hypocrisy, the duplicity of Iran being squeezed by sanctions starting under the W. Bush administration and continuing under Obama, leading to the negotiations to the uh, JCPOA, which was a six-nation deal that the U.S. backed out of unilaterally. Zarif said that from 2003 to 2012, Iran was under the most severe U.N. sanctions ever to be imposed on a country that did not have nuclear weapons. He said that the JCPOA is a difficult agreement, not a perfect one. But the Non-Proliferation Treaty was based on three pillars, non-proliferation, disarmament, and access to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. Meanwhile, the later agreement was based on two pillars, economic normalization of Iran and Iran observing certain limits on nuclear development. And... Zarif says, when Trump decided to withdraw from the JCPOA, we triggered the dispute resolution mechanism that they had insisted on with John Kerry. But they got nowhere. He says, if what was promised to Iran in terms of economic normalization is delivered, even partially, we are prepared to show good faith and come back to the implementation of the JCPOA. And toward the end some blistering comments from Zarif. There is still an arms embargo against Iran on the way, but we are capable of shooting down a U.S. drone spying in our territory. We are trying simply to be independent. We never said we will annihilate Israel. Somebody said Israel will be annihilated. We never said we will do it. I was the only one... Oh, then he quotes uh, Netanyahu. I was the only one against the JCPOA. Uh, I managed to destroy it. What is the problem? Well, now to the voice of Zarif. The problem is we decided not to fold. That that is our only crime. We had a revolution against the government that was supported by the United States, imposed on our country by the United States, that tortured our people. He's talking about the Shah. And never received a single human rights condemnation. Now people are worried why they say death to America. We say death to these policies because they have brought nothing but this farce. What did they bring us? If somebody came to the United States, removed your president, imposed a dictator who killed your own people, wouldn't you say death to that country? Today, the Secretary of State of the United States says publicly, if Iran wants to eat, it has to obey the United States. This is a war crime. Starvation is a crime against humanity. It's a newspeak headline. If Iran wants its people to eat, it has to follow what he said. He says, death to the entire Iranian people. So it's a very strong piece, and I encourage you to check it out. As I say, you can follow the link in the show file at peterbcollins.com. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people like you who support my work with your subscriptions to this podcast. People like Richard Mott, who just renewed an annual subscription. Susan Lewis, up in Northern California. John Morgan and Judy Holloway. Can you kick in 10, 5, 20? Notice how I jumbled them there? <laughs> uh, I'd be happy if you would. All you have to do is visit peterbcollins.com. You click on Menu, click on Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page, and it's easy to choose the level of support you're comfortable with. And if you want to avoid PayPal, use the U.S. mail. My P.O. box is number 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915 couple of stories on Bolivia today, where we are seeing just a couple of weeks out from the coup that the corporate media in this country is very comfortable whitewashing that coup. 
So the New York Times dispatched to correspondent Anatoly Kermanayev. And from the stronghold of the indigenous people that Evo Morales came from, the town of Via Tunari, Bolivia, he had to navigate a hundred barricades along the way from La Paz to this town. It's about a hundred miles. And he said、uh, when he got there, thousands of coca farmers, including children, are camped around the town's strategic river bridge, obstructing Bolivia's main highway and paralyzing its national economy. With no movement of goods, there are food and fuel shortages in major cities. They have a sympathetic quote from a coca farmer. Evo Morales is like a father to us. If he doesn't return, there won't be peace. And then the restatement of the facts, according to the New York Times, Bolivia began this week to move toward resolving the vicious political crisis that led to Morales' resignation from office earlier this month after 14 years as president. His downfall came after violent protests over a disputed election that he claimed to win, and after he had lost the backing of the military and the police. It was a coup, but you just heard the polite language of the gray lady. <laughs> Describe it as just a popular uprising against a guy who had overstayed. And that disputed election? No need for facts about that, right? If it's disputed, <laughs> it has to be overturned, unless, of course, it happens in the United States. Great piece by Alan McLeod. Writing at Mint Press News, as he recaps the New York Times' long-running support for American coups, and he starts with Bolivia, and then hits the Wayback Machine, and takes us to Iran, 1953,、uh, to Brazil, 1964, to Chile, 1973. I'm turning the pages here, as you can tell, and.、Uh, On to、uh, the first attempt to depose Hugo Chavez in 2002.、Uh, the New York Times editorial read, "With yesterday's resignation of Chavez, Venezuelan democracy is no longer threatened by a would-be dictator. Chavez, a ruinous demagogue, stepped down after the military intervened and handed power to a respected business leader, Pedro Carmona.、Uh, that lasted about 48 hours, and then." Chavez was reinstated. Also on the reporting front in Bolivia, Wyatt Reed of the Gray Zone Project,、uh, Dateline La Paz, says that the brutal military junta that seized power is consolidating that power. He quotes a left-wing journalist, Federico Coba. It's a fascist dictatorship. There's no hiding it. There are paramilitary agents going around the city, taking pictures, pinpointing who's who, who is a leader, who's a record, who is recording the protests, who is recording the repression. And then, Wyatt Reed scheduled an interview with a coworker of Coba, who used the name Mujica. But before they could meet. He was picked up by the cops and then texted that he was in jail. And they said that、uh, he had been taken to some unlisted facility, and then was released. And the first guy,、uh, oh, oh no, this is、uh, an unnamed member of the resistance, who said, "We know for sure we're on a list. We've seen it, and what they did to Muhika confirms it." And there's no whitewashing at the gray zone. Quote, Since their country was taken over by far-right landowning elites, virtually every leftist Bolivian with a public profile has begun to feel the heat. Minutes after I met, this is Reed's voice, another Bolivian citizen journalist who had first picked up a camera just weeks before, he hiked up his leg,、uh, his pants, to show me the wound that he had sustained just the day before. So it's a brutal situation there. And even at the Guardian, which has editorially supported the change of the guard in Bolivia without calling it a coup, they did permit Nick Estes to write a blistering op-ed called "Is Bolivia Turning into a Right-Wing Military Dictatorship?" And、uh, Estes, who I believe is a Native American, he writes knowingly about the crackdown, the repression of the indigenous people in Bolivia. And、uh, if you have time to read it. I encourage you to follow the link.
and check it out. Over at the Huffington Post, they quote、uh, people close to Barack Obama, saying that he has told them that he is going to work to prevent Bernie Sanders from becoming the nominee of the Democratic Party in 2020. Now these are private conversations, and of course the sources are not named, but. Via the reporter Ryan Lizza, who's now at Politico, the former president sees his role in the Democratic primary process as providing guardrails to make sure that it doesn't get too ugly and to unite the party when the nominee is clear. Back when Sanders seemed like more of a threat than he does now, Obama said privately that if Bernie were running away with the nomination, Obama would speak up to stop him. I believe he has started to do that, and I resent it. We do not need to have Barack Obama set the terms, and make sure that a corporate-approved moderate like him is the nominee in 2020. Also, a curious report at the Washington Post today. You may have heard that Elizabeth Warren、uh, was blamed for a post that went、uh, viral on Instagram and Facebook. Showing African American women holding signs indicating their support of Elizabeth Warren. Well, it turns out the photo came from a Black Lives Matter protest, and they had photoshopped the Warren、uh, signage and logos into the picture. Then, according to the Washington Post, it was pushed out by a troll who poses as a Warren supporter but is actually opposed. And listen to this language, all right? Because they say that Americans are now mimicking Russian agents in meddling in the American election. Homespun operations on social media represent a rising threat capable of inciting conflict among voters and turning unwitting users into agents of online deception. Four years after Russian agents weaponized social media in 2016, tech giants are grappling not just with foreign meddling but also with falsehoods spread by less sophisticated and frequently U.S.-based online sources. The Washington Post can't believe that Americans go on American social media. And put up divisive and misleading posts about American elections, and there couldn't have been any back in 2016, including the guy from Baltimore who made a lot of money、uh, with the false post that Pope Francis had endorsed Trump. It's just amazing. And finally, today, I have been telling you repeatedly that the Democrats facilitated. Fast tracking of a budget or a funding bill to keep the government from shutting down until March, and in doing so, they extended the domestic surveillance program that scoops up all of our telephone records. And yesterday, I reported that only 11 people were investigated using those phone call records in 2018. But get this. <laughs> Cuba has published rules governing the extensive, long-standing surveillance and undercover investigation of the island's 11 million people. A new decree approved by President Diaz-Canel on October 8th, made public last week, says prosecutors can approve eavesdropping and surveillance of any form of communication without consulting a judge. The country's powerful intelligence and security agencies have, for decades, maintained widespread surveillance of Cuban society through eavesdropping. Now this is dripping with contempt for the Cubans, right? Because they have published their policies for domestic surveillance without a hint that we're under constant domestic surveillance, and the policies are not public. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening to my news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube. And I am Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling under.